We want to continue our consideration of the relationship between faith and reason by looking at one of the documents of the Magisterium of the Church. And until Pope John Paul II wrote his encyclical Faith and Reason, uh, the First Vatican Council stood as the most recent um, magisterial discussion of this relationship of faith and reason. So we're going to look at Dei Filios, uh, that is Vatican I's document on uh, Revelation. Uh, this is again 1870. And in particular, we're going to look at chapter 4, which is on the topic of faith and reason. And if you were to follow Dei Filius, and we've already looked at it a few times, the previous chapters talk about revelation, and then talk about faith, and then again now we have chapter 4, this relationship of faith and reason. And to place this once again in its historical context, Vatican I in 1870 is trying to respond to two um, opposing errors, one being rationalism, that exalts reason to the to the exclusion of faith, saying reason alone gives us access to reality. And then the other opposite tendency or error was fideism or faithism that exalts faith when it comes to matters divine and says only faith gives us access to God um, and, and matters that he reveals and not reason. And the church uh, rejects both of these extremes and presents a, um, a middle course that keeps faith and reason in tension um, and keeps them in relationship. So in these upcoming slides, everything in the bullet points is a direct quote from um, chapter 4 of Dei Filius, which uh, you should have read uh, for this class. And we want to begin with this um, examining the intellectus fidei, um, again, that's the Latin for the understanding of the faith. And Dei Filius tells us that reason does indeed, when it seeks persistently, piously, and soberly, reason does achieve by God's gift some understanding and that most profitable of the mysteries. Now let's pause here and just look at this. Uh, it tells us that, first of all, reason, um, when it, when it, persistently, piously, and soberly seeks. So notice those adverbs. Persistently, it keeps after it. Piously, um, it keeps in mind the object that we're studying are the mysteries of God. And soberly, we, we do it seriously. The idea here is this is no mere um, uh, side occasion that we, we happen to consider the, the, uh, the truth of the faith. This is real serious engagement study it takes time it takes effort and it says it does this it achieves this by god's gift so that we always want to uh, frame these discussions of faith and reason with god's grace first of all god's revelation is itself a gift that he has revealed himself and we have something to 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 reason about second the gift of reason itself is a gift uh, our whole nature is a gift from god and then also this, um, this diving into the mysteries of the faith requires the gift of grace to habituate ourselves to things divine. So God's gift and his graces accompany this and, and uh, uh, make this uh, achievable. So through this uh, reason, seeking persistently, piously, soberly, with God's grace, with his gifts, it achieves some understanding and that most profitable of the mysteries. And this, I think, uh, I, I want to say counters um, the use of mystery as the great cop-out. <laughs> what is the Trinity? Eh, it's a mystery. Uh, I've, I've gotten this sometimes in class, that mystery is simply that which is unexplainable and why are we wasting our time? And we really want to resist that. It's not as if we could walk into a, a large theological library and say, eh, it's all a mystery. This is all pointless. No, the, the mysteries may be um, infinite truths, things that are ultimately unfathomable, but that doesn't mean we can't know something of them. And this says actually something of, of great profit, that most profitable we can know about the mysteries. So yes, we'll never know everything about the mysteries. They'll always remain mysteries. They'll actually always remain infinitely mysteries. But what we can know about the mysteries is, is great and of great profit. 
So yes, reason can plumb the depths of these mysteries to a certain degree. And then it tells us a little bit how. It gives us some idea of methodology. It says, whether by analogy from what it knows naturally, that is, we can approach the mysteries of faith using analogies of things around us, right? Um, I'll give you an example. One would be uh, St. Thomas Aquinas understands the seven sacraments uh, as analogies to the different stages of life. There's birth, there's growth, there's nourishment, etc. And so he uses that natural analogy of natural growth to understand the various sacraments. This is understanding the mysteries by analogy to what we know naturally. Um, another example would be St. Paul, in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, wants to explain to us the relationship between Christ and the church. A great mystery. He actually says, this is a great mystery in Ephesians 5. Um, and what he does is he explains it by analogy to something his readers already know, and that's marriage. That the, the love of, of Christ for the church is like the love of husband for a wife. So our reason seeks to know these mysteries and it knows it first by, or it can come to know them more deeply by analogy from what it knows naturally. And then it says, or from the connection of these mysteries with one another and with the final end of humanity. The idea being here that the, the truths of the faith, these mysteries of our faith, form a certain harmony, a, a certain symphony, or to use a different metaphor, a, 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 a tapestry, right? Where all of the parts all of the different aspects work together to produce a harmonious whole. So think of, uh, for instance, um, of the relationship between the Trinity and the Incarnation. This is one of those aspects where the mysteries are connected to one another. Why did God become man? Why did God, the second person, become one of us? Uh, and we can point back and say, well, because of the connection to our understanding of the Trinity, because as Trinity, God is love. And so it was most fitting for God who is love and loves us to want to participate uh, in, in our being as much as possible. And so we have the incarnation. So these two mysteries of Trinity and incarnation, we find this harmony, this symphony, this kind of uh, totality or tapestry. This is what it's talking about here for reason to kind of pull together these different strands and notice the connections these mysteries have with one another. It goes on to say, well, but there's still limits to reason before the mystery. Yes, we can draw great profit from plumbing the depths of the mysteries with our reason, but reason is never rendered capable of penetrating these mysteries in the way in which it penetrates those truths which form its proper object. What's the proper object of, of, of my reason? Well, it's the things around me. It's natural things. So, no, my mind will never know the Trinity the same way it knows my friends Bob, Steve, and Joe. Uh, it's, we're totally on two different orders. Can I know things about the Trinity which has been revealed? Yes. Can my reason organize those things into a system? Yes. Is that of great profit? Yes. Does the Trinity ever cease to be a mystery? No. The Trinity always remains a mystery, ultimately unfathomable. So the 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 ability to plumb these things and their depths with with reason has its very strong limits the document goes on to say for the divine mysteries by their very nature what they are so far surpass the created understanding that is our understanding that even when a revelation has been given and accepted by faith they the mysteries remain covered by the veil of that same faith and wrapped, as it were, in a certain obscurity. As long as in this mortal life we're away from the Lord, we walk by faith and not by sight. So it's, at, it's not as if at some point I believe in the mysteries of the faith because they become somehow uh, intrinsically clear to me. No, I, I, remain un, uh, uh, I remain in faith because God has revealed them, not because they suddenly make sense to me. So examples of this would be something like the relationship between prod providence and free will. God guides everything to its proper end, and yet we're truly free. Uh, those two things seem to be uh, uh, wrapped in this obscurity, at least at least to me, um, that we have to accept them in faith, even though we can't see how they maybe go together. Another would be the mystery of suffering, that sure, 
our rational minds can approach something of a, of a response to the problem of, of suffering. Um, but at the end of the day, there's something about the problem of suffering in the face of a good God that remains covered in the veil of our same faith, wrapped, as it were, in a certain obscurity. So as far as reason penetrates the truths of the faith, they remain uh, objects of faith in mystery. And then it goes on to talk about the unity of truth. It says, even though faith is above reason, there can never be any real disagreement between faith and reason. So two points here. Notice first, faith is above reason. Why? Well, first of all, because faith is based on God's testimony, which is more sure than any human reason. Uh, God cannot deceive nor be deceived, so his testimony is absolutely sure. So as far as its source, faith is above reason. And second, faith is above reason because of its object, because, because of what it, uh, uh, what it communicates. Reason communicates the things about us, from uh, rocks, rabbits, and roses, to galaxies and the intricacies of subatomic particles, all wonderful, amazing things, but infinitely less than the object of faith, which is the infinite God. So faith is above reason in both its uh, surety, in its source, and also in what it, uh, what it communicates, its object. And then notice there can never be between these two, faith and reason, there can never, never be any real disagreement. Real disagreement, that is to say, apparent disagreement, yes. So when there is an apparent disagreement, what we can be sure of is that it is only apparent, that something has gone awry, and we're either not understanding the faith properly or reason has gone awry, one of the two. And the reason for this unity of the truth, of both faith and reason, is that truth finds its source in God. It says, since it is the same God who reveals the mysteries and infuses faith, and who has endowed the human mind with the light of reason, both faith and reason, and the truths of faith and reason come from the same source. And so there's a unity of truth in its source. And it goes on to tell us about this unity of truth, that God cannot deny himself, right? The same God who gave faith and who gave, gave, gave reason cannot deny himself, nor can truth ever be in opposition to truth. It makes no sense to say uh, we believe one thing by faith and a completely contradictory thing by reason. We can't compartmentalize or segregate out the truths of faith and reason in that way. No, truth cannot contradict truth and God cannot contradict himself. The God of faith and the God of reason cannot contradict himself because they're one God who's revealed this truth in two different ways. So it goes on to say the appearance of this kind of specious contradiction or false contradiction is chiefly due to the fact that either one, the dogmas of faith are not understood and explained in accordance with the mind of the church. Or two, unsound views are mistaken for the conclusions of reason. So again, either one or the other, faith or reason, has gone awry. So things like dogmas of the faith not understood and explained in accordance with uh, the mind of the church. Um, this would be something if, if we just misunderstood the Trinity and we said, well, we, the Trinity is just God is one and God is three in the same sense, and that's all we mean. Well, that's just a contradiction. We have to distinguish certain things. Well, God is one in his nature and he's three in his persons. We have to make sure that our theology is at least sophisticated enough to, to uh, eliminate um, specious or false misunderstandings. Um, and then there are certain things that some people just assume are, are, are Catholic beliefs that, that aren't. Um, for instance, um, a, um, an, uh, an insistence on literal seven-day creationism and, and young earth uh, creationism. Well, the church doesn't insist on that. So if, if uh, the best of science says uh, to the contrary, well, the, the Catholic isn't bound to young earth seven-day creationism. So we have to know what the church teaches first. But then also, um, we have to make sure science doesn't go beyond its bounds. I, I heard someone recently say science disproves miracles. <laughs> and that's simply, first of all, not possible. And, and second, that's just not what science does. And it hasn't. Uh, you know, you can't point to an experiment of a scientist that tested with a control that's, uh, um, that miracles are impossible. So there are these broad claims uh, especially in the kind of the colloquial use of science that goes beyond the true bounds of science. Things like Darwin, therefore no God, <laughs> right? Well, there, there's, 
uh, there, there's, that just doesn't follow, right? So we have to keep within the bounds of both faith and we have to keep within the bounds of both science as two disciplines that point to the truth. And if one tries to cross over into the other beyond its own methods, that's where we start to see these appearances of kind of a specious contradiction. So it goes on, therefore we define, the church defines that every assertion contrary to the truth of enlightened faith is totally false. This makes sense if, if what came before is, is true. If faith and reason cannot contradict each other, then um, if, if we have a truth of enlightened faith, that the opposite is false. We, we mean that truth is truth, right? It goes on to say, hence, all faithful Christians are forbidden to defend as the legitimate conclusions of science those opinions which are known to be contradictory or contrary to the doctrine of faith, particularly if they have been condemned by the church, and furthermore, they're absolutely bound to hold them to be errors which wear the deceptive appearance of truth. This is just reiterating the idea that truth doesn't contradict truth. This idea, for instance, uh, again, you might find uh, in the New Atheists that evolution, therefore, no God. Well, that would be the kind of thing that we'd have to say, well, hang on, that conclusion doesn't follow. Uh, simply because we hold a form of Darwinism or evolutionism doesn't mean that there is no God and that conclusion that there is therefore no providential God just doesn't follow from science. And we wouldn't, we couldn't hold that. We'd have to say, well, that's not a legitimate conclusion of science. Or another example would be in the studies of the human person as a biological and, and psychological reality. If the conclusion is naturalism or materialism, that the human person is merely matter, we'd have to say, well, hang on. Again, that goes beyond the bounds of scientific method, and um, um, we'd have to say, well, that would be an incorrect thing. So this is what the church is saying, that listen, when, um, uh, when a proposition of science goes beyond its proper methodology and bounds and, and contradicts a known truth of the faith, they can't both be true. And I hope we see that, that contradictory things can't both be true. And then it goes on to talk about this mutual enrichment of faith and reason. It says not only can faith and reason never be at odds with one another, but they must mutu but they mutually support each other. There's a symbiosis here, right? For on the one hand, right reason establishes the foundations of faith, right? It, it answers the question why believe it all. It doesn't leave faith as simply a mere whim, right, or a mere sentiment. Uh, uh, it gives us foundations on which to build faith and reason illuminated by its light or, or faith illuminated by the light of reason develops the science of divine things this reasoned um or this reasoning on matters divine that gives us the science of theology this fetus corns intellective right faith seeking understanding that's theology so that faith is not a blind leap in contradiction to reason it's a it's a, a, a proper exercise of human freedom and rationality, and also our faith can be explored in its depths. On the other hand, faith delivers reason from errors and protects it and furnishes it with knowledge of many kinds. As I said in the other video, faith brings in things like our origin from God and our end that we're made for communion with God and communion with the, the Trinity who is love. Um, faith brings in the centrality of love in all created reality. The idea here is reality is more than the empirical. Reality is more than the measurable. Reality is more than the hard sciences can show us. And so faith delivers to reason uh, these other supplements that it can't know by itself. Gives reason a, a broader view of reality. And then it goes on to talk about the church and the sciences. <clears throat> it says, hence, so far as the church from hindering the development of the human arts and studies, that in fact she assists and promotes them in many ways. Um, and this goes beyond the, the bounds of this video, but the supposed war between faith and science is simply a false narrative. And I would say particularly for the Catholic. If you look at our the church's history, the great scientists that came out of it, actually the, 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 the birth of science in the West, uh, it, it's largely in partnership and in dialogue with the church. Um, Catholics in particular don't check their reason or their brains or their scientific method at the door of the laboratory. The document goes on to say, for she, the church, is neither ignorant nor contemptuous of the advantages which derive from this source for human life, that is the sciences, 
Rather, she acknowledges that those things flow from God, the Lord of sciences, and if they are properly used, lead to God by the help of his grace. So the idea that the sciences can actually lead us to God, I mean, the, the, the further the sciences dig into the order of creation, right, and the intricacies and its beauty, that's, that's kind of the raw material for a philosophy that then points to the order of a creator. So again, the church and the sciences, it goes on, nor does the church forbid these studies to employ each which in its, within its own area, its own proper principles and methods. But while she admits this just freedom, she takes particular care that they do not become infected with errors by conflicting with divine teaching or by going beyond their proper limits, intrude upon what belongs to faith and engender confusion. So again, science has to remain within the scientific methodology, just as faith has to remain within the bounds of revelation and reason. Um, and the, the two can't tread improperly on the ground of the other. Two different disciplines, two different ways of coming to know the truth, two different methodologies, they become confused and in conflict or apparent conflict when they go beyond their proper methodologies and objects. And so there's a final call for the absolute validity of revelation, right? That there's something absolute about revelation because it comes from God. It says, for the doctrine of the faith which God has revealed is put forward not as some philosophical discovery capable of being perfected by human intelligence. We didn't come up with this. We didn't invent it. It's not a mere myth we follow. It's not something that we decided was good one day. It's not something simply pragmatic or helpful or makes us good. But no, this is revealed by God. So we're not, uh, we're, we're not expecting it to be improved upon, right, or corrected by something other than uh, by God himself. So human reason submits itself to these truths of the faith. So it is rather a divine deposit committed to the spouse of Christ, that is the church. Divine deposit committed to the church, the spouse of Christ, to be faithfully protected and infallibly promulgated. So there's this final note then of the priority of faith and the role of the church. So again, you see this strong emphasis on a vital relationship, a rapport, a symbiosis between faith and reason, um, that they each mutually support each other. And when you cut one out, the human person is impoverished in their ability to know reality, either by faith alone or by reason alone.